Hello, and welcome to Scattered Terrain. My name is Meredith, and today I'm going to be showing you how I make my vine skeletons. Here's what you're going to need. A pair of scissors and some wire cutters, a nice pair of side cutters, an X-Acto blade, liquid super glue and a safe place to work over, a skeleton mini, thin flexible wire, raffia or paper ribbon, something to use as a drying stand, some epoxy putty, green stuff, milliput, anything like that, your basing materials, black and white spray primer, your painting supplies, and whatever paints and washes you'll be using. The first thing we need to do is start off by preparing our skeleton mini. So I'm gonna grab one sprue out of the box here, and then I'm gonna take a look at what my options are. Now with these War Games Atlantic skeletons, they give me a couple of options for putting the skeleton together. I can either put him together with all of his arms and legs separately, or they have bodies where the legs are already attached. And this time I'm gonna go with the one that already has the legs on it. So I'm gonna grab a good pair of side cutters that I only use for trimming models. That way they stay as clean and sharp edged as possible. And then I'm gonna put the flat side as close to the mini as I can and snip all the connecting points to the sprue. I'll just get these two up top here, and there we go, he's free. And then I'm gonna flip this around and pick out a skull and do the same thing, keeping the flat edge of the clippers as close to the skull as possible. And then we'll just pop that out here. And it looks like my overall height of the skeleton with the head is gonna come out to just about an inch and a half, which is gonna be important later when we're cutting our wire. My next step is gonna be to clean up these connection points where I snipped it off of the sprue. So I'm gonna grab my X-Acto blade, now what you want to do is use the back of the X-Acto blade to scrape the plastic off as opposed to using the sharp side of the blade. This keeps you from accidentally digging in too far. And as you can see, I'm resting my hands on top of each other here and using that as a sort of a hinge point to make sure that I'm always in control of this blade. And you just want to be patient and slowly scrape away at that high point until it's smooth. Now looking at this second connection point, as you can see here, that is much thicker than the other one. So I actually am gonna start with the sharp of the blade on this side and very carefully using that same pivoting motion, I'm going to remove as much of that extra sprue as I can and then go back in with the back of the blade and finish off scraping it down to being smooth again. Then moving to those two higher connection points on the shoulders. These are also pretty thick, so I'm going to be very careful and take off as much as I can with the sharp of the blade. And then flip back over and do that finishing off by scraping with that back side edge. Now it does take a little bit of finesse to get the angle right, so I highly recommend practicing on a test model first until you get the hang of it. And then jumping over to the skull and cleaning that up exactly the same way, just using the flat side of the blade very gently to scrape the skull smooth. And then let's just check here, blow off some of the extra. <sighs> yeah, that looks good. And you know, I think for this skeleton, I do want him to have an arm. So I'm gonna grab that sprue one more time and then pick out the arm I want grab hold of the piece between my fingers, and then use my snips to disconnect it from the sprue. Now I'm holding onto the piece with my fingers in order to keep it from accidentally bending or snapping while I'm removing it. Oh, and it looks like there's one more connection point. There it is. All right, and now that we've got that off the sprue, we just need to follow that same step with the X-Acto blade and clean off any extra from those connection points. Now, depending on the piece that you're cleaning, this can sometimes be an interesting thing to try and get a hold of to make sure that you have control, but it's very, very important when you're working with something as sharp as an X-Acto blade, never start moving unless you know you have control of your blade. It is very easy to hurt yourself pretty badly with one of these, so you just want to make sure you're being careful. And we'll just clean off this last spot here. There we go. All right, now that we have all of our pieces cut out and cleaned, our next step is assembly. I always like to take a minute to dry fit everything and make sure it's all gonna go together the way that I want it to before I start applying glue. Now if you take a look at the connection point on the bottom of the skull here, you can see they've got this divot, so it allows us to position the head on the top of the neck pretty much any way we want. As you can see here, that gives me a really good range of motion. And it's the same with the arms. They have a ball and socket joint, so it's very flexible as far as what the poses can be. So I'm just gonna take a minute here and dry fit that arm and play around a little bit with the various pose options, kind of get an idea in my head of what I'm going for before I start gluing things together. Yeah, I think I like the look of that. So next we're gonna grab that liquid super glue, give it a good shake, 
and then put just the tiniest bit into that shoulder socket joint. Grab my arm here, and then using my hands to brace against each other so that I don't move, I'm gonna hold the arm in place for about 30 seconds to make sure that that super glue has time to set enough to hold in place. And then I'm going to very gently and slowly let go to make sure that it doesn't fall off when I do. All right, and now that that's holding, I'm gonna move on, put a little drop of glue on the top of the neck and set the skull in place. Once again, I'm gonna brace my hands together using my pinky in order to make sure that my hands are steady. I'm gonna take a minute to make sure that the head is facing the direction that I want. Hold on to it for just a few moments, make sure that it's set and not gonna fall off. And that finishes the assembly of our skeleton. Now, normally at this point, you'd stick your mini down to its base, but it's actually gonna be a lot easier to wrap it in vines if he's not stuck down yet. So next, we're gonna move on to making our vines. The first thing that we're going to need for our vines is raffia. This is what I use to cover the wire with and give it a really good texture. Now, in order to use the raffia, we need to unravel it. And as you'll see here, I always store it with the end of it still unraveled to make it easy to start up the next piece. But in order to show you how I unravel the raffia when I get it fresh, I'm gonna go ahead and cut off this extra bit and show you as if it was a brand new piece. So this is what you should be looking at when you've got a freshly bought piece from the store. I start off by rolling it between my fingers to sort of soften it up and separate it out a little bit to start. And that usually lets me find a little bit of an edge that I can get a hold of and start to pinch and pull out. Now, as soon as you're able to get a little bit of it started, you wanna go ahead and unravel the entire end until you have enough that you can pinch it between your thumb and a couple of fingers. Then move your other hand three or four inches down the piece of raffia and give a gentle pulling and twisting motion in the direction that the raffia is raveled. Then you just take your thumb and curl it under against the raffia, guiding your thumb into that channel that's being formed, and then slide your hand away, causing it to open fully. Then move your top hand that's pinching down as far as it's open, get a new hold, move your left hand away, give that gentle twisting pulling motion, and then glide your leading thumb to meet it. Now, as you can see here, once you get the hang of that, you can start to move pretty quickly in getting this unraveled. And I tend to go until I hit a point where I tear it. Oop, just like that. Then head back to the beginning and take your time now and really spread the raffia open by doing a sort of curled pinch pulling motion. It's sort of difficult to explain, but you can see what I'm doing here with my thumb and fingers to sort of gently unravel those edges, trying as hard as I can not to pull hard enough to tear. This is a little bit fragile. And just be patient and take your time and work your way down the length. I find it's really helpful to take this and sit and watch a movie while unraveling for a bit and just really go to town and unravel a good chunk. That way I have a couple rolls of it sitting around ready to be used anytime I have a need. Then when you get the length that you want unraveled, make sure to cut it, leaving some of that unraveled edge on the roll. It'll make it much easier to get started next time. Then to easily roll this raffia up for later use, I'm going to loop it over on itself, pinch that loop together with my finger and thumb, and then just very carefully roll it up, and then set this aside for later use. Then we're gonna grab our thin flexible wire. I like using florist's wire, but just about any crafting wire will work as long as you can bend it easily. And then for this, we're gonna grab those heavy duty wire cutters. Once again, you don't wanna use your hobby snips for this. And then I'm gonna cut my wire to be twice the height of my skeleton. So since he was an inch and a half, that means I'm gonna be cutting these at three inches long. Then we'll slide those aside and I'm gonna cut a couple extra at four inches long. That way I have a little bit of variety. And I like having anything from two to five vines per skeleton. So cut a few extra and make sure you have enough. You can always use the extra vines on something else later. Now that we have our pieces ready, let's move on to making the vine itself. We're gonna grab a roll of our raffia and that cut wire. And then we're also gonna grab that liquid super glue and our safe working place. I like to use the lid of a jar, but you can also use a paper plate or a piece of cardboard, just about anything to protect your work surface. And then I'm also going to grab something to dry my vine on so that I don't accidentally glue it to my table. For my fancy drying rack, I took a toilet paper roll and cut it down to a few shorter heights. Then you're gonna unroll your raffia and cut out a length that is just a little bit longer than the wire that you're wrapping. As we do our next step, it's gonna shorten the length a little bit, so you wanna have a little bit extra. So you're gonna pick up your length of raffia and fold it in half to create a channel for the wire. Then set your wire down into that crease, hold it in place with your fingers and fold the raffia over the top. 
Then pinching your fingers together at the center of the wire, you're going to use an opposite twisting motion to start wrapping the raffia around the wire. Once I've got a good couple twists started in the center, I like to move off to one side, make sure the wire's not poking a hole out through the raffia, get everything nicely lined up here, and then making sure that I'm holding that wire in place with my right hand, I'm gonna start using a twisting motion with the fingers of my left hand and start twisting the raffia around the wire. And once you get that twisting motion going, you can start sliding your hands to the end of the wire, twisting as you go, until you get a nice tight twist all the way to the end. Then you just flip the whole thing over so that you're still holding that center point, get the other end straightened out with your fingers, and use that same pinching twisting method. Now you do want to be careful if your wire does start to poke out through the raffia, you want to stop, back up the twist a little bit until it pops backwards through its own hole, because as you untwist your raffia is going to get longer again. Then make sure that you've got it so that he's not going to poke out through that same hole the second time, and then just start that twist up again, and work through until you've twisted to the end. Then I like to grab both ends and give a couple good strong twists in that same direction to really make sure it's not going to unravel on me. And then as a final step, I like to give a little bit of a natural twist to the end of the wire. I don't do it with all of them so that I do have variety, but I like there to be a little bit of a bend at the end so that they're not all completely straight and pointy. Then we're going to grab that liquid super glue, give it a good shake, and then working over my drip tray just in case, I'm going to give a nice soaking to the tip of the wire to make sure that it doesn't unravel. And if your raffia went past the tip of your wire a little bit, no worries, you just want to make sure that you soak in enough glue till you're past the point where you know there's wire. Then I'm going to flip it over to the other side, make sure that I've got a good curl there, and then do that same soaking with the super glue. Once both ends of your wire are locked in place, just set that on one of your drying racks, and then I go in and very carefully put a drop of super glue in just a few spots along the wire to make sure that it's not going to unravel on me. You don't want to put too much or you won't be able to bend this around later and then just work your way through all of your wires and set them aside to dry. Now that I've shown you the standard basic way to make the vines, I'm going to show you an option that I have to make them look a little bit thinner and more refined. If you mix and match the two options together, it makes a great look. It starts exactly the same by laying out a piece of raffia and cutting it to be just a little bit longer than your wire. But this time, instead of folding it in half, first I'm going to cut it right down the middle and make the whole thing thinner. Then I'm going to fold it in half. And from here, the process is exactly the same as it was before, but because we're working with half as much raffia, the overall result is going to be much thinner. Just that same gentle pinching, twisting motion that allows you to just ravel it all the way to the end. And finish that off with one final twist in both directions, making sure we've got that wrapped nice and tight. And as you can see here in this quick side-by-side -side comparison, it really makes quite a bit of a difference in the overall thickness of the vine. Both vines work perfectly well, they just give you a slightly different look in the finished product. As you can see with these two vine skeleton minis, the one on the left has a much thinner and delicate look, and the one on the right has a far stronger and chunkier finish. It's really just a question of the look that you're going for. And as I mentioned before, it can also work out really well to mix both of them together on the same project. I'll just get these out of the way here. Let me just grab my safe work surface and my drying rack and just retwist and lock down these ends with super glue. Make sure it's not going to unravel from the center and set him aside to dry. Now that our skeleton is assembled and dried and we've made all of our vines, it's time to put the two together and wrap our skeleton. So take a quick look through the vines that you're using, pick the one that you want to start with, and let's see, I think I'm going to take that curly cue on the end of this one and let it wrap around his sword hand. Just play with that a minute until I get it in the position that I like. Yeah, there we go, I like it there. Then I'm going to pinch that vine in place with my fingers, and very gently I'm going to start wrapping the vine around the skeleton arm, working my way towards the torso. Oh, and I didn't quite have that skull glued on well enough, it popped right off. But no worries on that, we can glue him back on in a minute. I'm going to just keep going and wrap around the opposite shoulder joint there so that I can start forming the basis of the arm that he's missing. Let's see, I want him to have a sort of grabbing motion, so tweak that a little bit until I get the angle that I want. One of the things that's really nice about using this thin flexible wire is that it's very easy to manipulate. Now let me just go fetch that head that rolled off. I'm just gonna set this skull aside for now and we'll glue him back on near the end. 
Now that I've got my first vine in place and the basics of the missing arm formed, I'm gonna move to the longest of my wires here. And once again, I'm gonna start by manipulating that cupped edge around one of his limbs as the starting point, hold that in place, and then gently use my other hand to thread that wire around. By pinching hold of the places that you've already wrapped the vines around, it helps you from accidentally pulling too hard and unraveling the vine behind yourself. And then we'll just thread through that spot between the arm and the leg here. And take a moment to make sure that I've popped the vine into that cavity between the rib cage and the hip. And then I'm gonna go ahead and wrap around the back of the spine and come down that same side in front before wrapping around and going down the other leg. Now, as you're wrapping, if you find that the direction that you're going is unraveling your vines, just give it a quick twist between your fingers and make sure you're keeping everything tight. All right, and then this guy's actually gonna be a little bit too long to go down and stop on the other foot, so I'm gonna curl back up at this point and start heading towards that missing arm instead. Let's see here, and it looks like... Actually, it looks like it's gonna cross over the front of the body and then curl up maybe behind the head here over this shoulder. Yeah, I think I like the way that looks. One of the benefits of this method is you can really play with your vines because nothing is locked in place until the final step when we start gluing things. Up until that point, everything is sort of being held in place by the wire, so you can really play with things and get the position that you want. All right, and then I know with this final piece of wire that I really need to bulk out that missing arm. So instead of starting at the end of a limb, I'm gonna insert through here and make sure that one of my ends starts at the end of that missing arm. And I don't want it all to just be a boring straight out vine, so this one I'm gonna wrap around that first vine. I'm also gonna come around and then go the opposite direction wrapping around the first two vines to give a third vine to bulk out that arm. All right, and then I'm just gonna take a minute here to go back and fix any wire that I smushed out of place. That is the downside to the soft wire is as you're pinching things to manipulate it, sometimes you can undo things you've done before. And you know, I think this vine is sticking just a little bit too far out from the body, so I'm gonna use my thumbnail to really push in against that vine and sort of suck it in towards the skeleton a bit. And then tweak him from the other direction. And then to finalize the position of that missing arm, I'm gonna set him down on the table and just take a moment to manipulate the pose and make sure I'm happy with how he's gonna look when he's standing. Let's see, I think I want the end curls of the vine here to be spread out just a little bit more. Really give him that look like he's reaching out towards you with it. Then it's time for gluing him down to the stand and locking everything in place. So we're gonna give that liquid super glue a quick shake. Oh, do a quick double check of the bottom before you start gluing to make sure you've got a good smooth surface. And then give it a nice coating with the super glue. Set him onto your one inch base. Give him a quick spin around with your fingers to make sure that he's completely centered. And then give a nice, firm, gentle downward pressure to lock him to that spot. Then very carefully, I'm going to hold him in such a way that I'm keeping him to the base, but not touching any super glue. And then I'm going to use that liquid super glue to give a good once over to all of the vines that are wrapping the entire skeleton. You want to make sure that you're saturating all of that raffia so that when this dries, it's a rock solid piece and it's not going to keep bending. Now this is something that is going to be putting off a fair amount of fumes, so I highly recommend that while you do this you are either in a very well ventilated area and or you've got a good respirator on. And if you see anything about the pose that you don't like, this is your last opportunity to fix it. I'm just going to fix where this is wrapping around the hand here. There we go. Lock that down in place with my super glue. Now, as you can see here, I'm living very dangerously and working directly over my work surface with this liquid super glue. I've been using it for many years and I'm very confident that I have full control over it. And even I spill it sometimes. I highly recommend that if you're using this liquid super glue, be working over cardboard or a pallet or something that's gonna protect your work surface. All right, and then once you think you've got it completely covered in glue, I'm just gonna give it a quick once over here, make sure I'm not missing anything. Yeah, that's looking good. Huh? And anytime you think you might have some super glue on your fingers, you wanna be real quick to wipe it off because super glue will glue skin to skin instantly. And now that we've got all this in place, we're gonna go ahead and put our skull back on. So we're gonna put super glue back onto the top of the neck there. And I'm going to very carefully get that skull positioned back where I want him. And hold that in place for about 30 seconds, make sure he's not gonna pop off again. Oh, and he's not quite looking where I want him, let's just tweak that over to the side here. Make sure he's got that menacing gaze aimed at whoever he's reaching out for. Back just a little. There we go. Alright, he's looking good. 
And since he lost his head once already, I'm just gonna go back into the back of the neck here and add a little bit of extra super glue to reinforce that bond. Maybe a little more from the front here too. All right, and once he is completely coated in super glue and ready to go, we're gonna set him aside to dry. Once he's completely dry, it's time to move on to basing. I like using epoxy putty to smooth out the transition from the mini's base to the one inch base that I've glued him to. But as you can see here, my epoxy putty has a warning that this is known in the state of California to cause cancer. Now I don't currently live in the state of California, but I severely doubt that state lines causes the cancer risk to change. So I'm gonna go ahead and glove up for safety. Now this two part epoxy putty comes on a tape like this. So I'm just gonna unroll a little bit Use my scissors to cut off the amount that I think I'm gonna need, then peel off that plastic coating. Now because the tape has both parts of the epoxy touching each other, it creates this hard line down the center. So I like to take a pair of scissors and just cut out that very center hard bit before mixing the two sides together, that way I don't have any hard lumps in my putty. Then we're gonna take our two equal sized halves and mix them together until we have a nice solid green color. I find that twisting the two pieces together is a great way to start the mix off strong. And if your fingers start to get tired, you can use the thumb of one hand to sort of knead the putty against the palm of your other hand. I also find it helpful to roll it out into snakes and then twist it back on itself to make sure that you have a good homogenous blend. It's sort of like when mixing two-part resin. You want to make sure that everything is completely mixed so that it all sets firm and hard. If you don't get it completely mixed, there's going to be some parts that don't quite set right. And then once I have it mixed as far as it needs to be, I'm gonna pinch off a smaller piece of this because as always, I mixed up too much. And I'm gonna roll it out until I have a nice long snake. Oh, still a little bit too long, I think. We're just gonna put a little bit off to the side here. And I like to store any extra pieces on this insert from the packaging that it doesn't stick to. Then I'm gonna lay that snake right along the edge of the miniature base and slowly work my way all the way around and pinch off any extra and set it aside. Then I'm gonna go around it again using the flat of my finger to press down on that snake and make a nice gentle transition from where the skeleton is standing to that one inch base. Oh, and if you've got an area that's kind of hard to get to, you can try flipping your finger over and using your nails to press it flat. But even then, sometimes with these miniatures, there are things that are just gonna be out of reach. So I find it very helpful to keep a pencil on hand. That gives you that nice pointy cone shape that you can fit into just about anywhere and then roll back and forth to create a nice smooth blend. And I just wanna make sure that I don't have any spots that are sticking up or looking weird. There's still a little bit of a lip here that I just need to press flat. And then just make sure none of that putty is leaking over the edge of the lip. Do a final pass, make sure it's all smooth and good. All right, and then I just set that aside to let the putty cure. Now don't let this extra that you've mixed up go to waste. There is a lot of stuff that you can do with epoxy putty, but that's another video. For now, let's get cleaned up and move on to basing. For me, that means basing with train ballast. So I'm going to grab my basing boat and my bag of ballast and some matte Mod Podge. Then we're gonna grab our miniature and a brush that is set aside for glue purposes only. And then you're just gonna give the whole base a good once over with the Mod Podge, being careful when you get around the feet of the skeleton to try not to get any of the Mod Podge on the feet directly. Oh, and just a little more around the back here. And then I'm gonna do a quick wipe with my finger all the way around the rim to make sure that we don't have any glue over that edge again. And then I'm gonna take a healthy pinch of my train ballast and just sprinkle it all over the base, just like flocking. And once again, I'm gonna do that spin to make sure we don't have any stuck to the edge of the rim. Yeah, that looks good. Now we can set him aside to dry. And here's where that flocking boat comes in handy. You can just pick up the whole thing and pour it right back into the bag. Easy cleanup. Once that's completely dry, it's prime time. What I like to do is take the mini outside, give him a complete coating with that black spray primer, and then do a Zenithal highlight. What that means is your white paint is going to be acting like a light source. So once the mini is spray painted completely black, you're gonna go back with the white spray paint and instead of shooting him from all angles, you're only gonna spray him from a downwards angle at about a 45 degree. This way, any of the surfaces on the upper half where the light would touch and bounce off, it's going to be white. And anywhere that's gonna be an undersurface where the light's not gonna reach as easily is gonna stay black. That way when you go back to do the painting of color, you've got a lot of that shading built right in. 
Now in order to make the painting process easier, I like to stick my minis onto a painting handle. I use a small jar filled about halfway with water. The water adds weight to the bottom and helps keep it from tipping over as easy, but it also moves in your hand as you tip it, that way the weight is always at the bottom. And then I grab a piece of poster tack and use that to stick him to the top of the lid. Give a gentle but firm pressure to the mini and you're all set. My first step in the painting process is going to be washing all of the bones with a sepia color. If you're making your own washes at home, a sepia is going to be a very pale brown. You're not going to have much black in it at all. And then I'm going to grab a brush that is bigger than a mini painting brush because you want the wash to be able to hold itself in the bristles some. Get a good soaking in the wash. Let some of it go back out into the pot so we don't have too much wash on our brush. And then I start at the head and work my way downwards, making sure to really fill in the holes on the front because you want to make sure that the wash goes into all of those crevices and you really get those deep shadows. And then just slowly work my way down the body, covering absolutely any bits of bone that I see with the wash color. You don't want to have any bright white spots left at the end because they'll really jump out at you. And we're going to make sure we get the back underside of this arm and all the way down to that hand that's wrapped around the sword, and then down both legs. And this is where that painting handle really comes in handy. It makes it much easier to spin the model around and look at it from any angle. All right, and then now that I've made it to the bottom, I'm just gonna work my way back up, make sure I don't have any spots that I missed there. Now, when I came back up to the top, I went all the way over the head a second time, and what this did was it made the wash a little bit darker than I wanted it to be. So you do want to be careful when you're doing the wash layer that if what you've done has already dried, you don't want to go back over it a second time, otherwise you are going to get a darker coat. All right, give him a quick once over, check and make sure nothing's missing. Yeah, he is looking good. So we're going to set him aside and let that wash dry. And with these Citadel washes, you want to make really sure that you click them all the way shut. If you don't push down until you hear that click, you can leave a crack and your wash will start to evaporate and it'll start getting much darker very quickly. Once that wash is dry, our next step is going to be to paint any swords, weapons, or accessories that you've got. So I'm going to grab my cup of rinse water, my fancy palette, and a paper towel. And for the handle of his sword, I'm going to use a burnt sienna. Quick tip, I like to put a little bit of the paint onto the cap of my paint. That way, if the label doesn't quite match the color inside, you can tell right away what color you've actually got. Now, because I'm only going to be painting the handle of the sword with this color, I don't want to waste paint by squeezing some out onto my palette. So the paint that's in the cap here is going to be enough. Then using one of my fine detailed mini brushes, I'm going to get it wet so that the paint moves easily into the brush, dry off any of the excess water so that I'm not watering down my paint. And after I dip the brush into the paint the first time, I like to do a little bit of a twisting, pulling motion on my palette to really work the paint into the bristles. That way when I move to painting on the mini, I don't find my brush immediately running out of paint. And I'm gonna set that cap out of the way so that I don't accidentally put my hand into it. And then very carefully, I'm gonna go in around the fingers and the vines and pick out the detail of that handle. And once again, you can see how I use the pinky of my painting hand to rest against the miniature or the painting handle to give myself stability. Really helps if you've got shaky hands. And give a quick once over here, make sure I didn't miss anything. Then rinse any of the paint out of the brush immediately. You don't wanna let paint dry in your bristles. And we're gonna switch over to painting the blade. For that, I'm going to be using Vallejo Model Color Oily Steel. I find for metallics, it's worth buying the fancier mini paints to get that better coverage. But that's also why I'm using one of my synthetic mini brushes instead of using one of my sable hair brushes. Metallic paint can damage your paintbrush. Now we'll put the tiniest little bit of this paint onto our palette because we don't want to waste any. Once again, I'm going to make sure I'm working with a damp brush and work some of that paint into the bristles. Then this time I'm going to paint upside down, and here's another place where that painting handle really comes in handy. It allows me to hold my mini at the perfect angle to be able to paint the blade as easily as possible. And I want to make sure that I'm painting all the way down to meet the handle and covering the full length of the blade. Then we're going to flip over and do exactly the same thing to the back. And then I'm also going to turn and make sure that I'm getting that little flat part between the two sides of the blade and the sharp part itself as well. Once again, you don't want to leave any of the white showing through because it'll really jump out at you when we're finished. And just go back in here and cover over a second time. Make sure there's nothing that's got any thick spots or streaky bits. Oh, looks like I need a little bit more right here. There we go. 
And then just a final once over here, working from handle to tip to make sure that any brush strokes that I may have are going in the same direction as the blade. And once again, we are going to immediately rinse that brush out and get it clean. Then I'm going to move from that detail brush back up to a slightly larger brush for painting all of my vines. Now for the vines, I'm actually going to be using craft paints instead of mini paints because I want the vines to match all of my existing foliage. So we're going to give that a good shake and get a good amount onto our palette here. And once more, starting with that damp brush, we're going to work some green paint into the bristles. And this time I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up and paint all of the vines with this lovely green. Now, since this is our final paint color, you do wanna be fairly careful with this and try not to touch the bone anywhere. If there are any spots where you do wind up having an accident and painting something that you don't want, if you move fast and rinse out your brush real quick, you can then use that damp brush to sort of mop off the part that you touched. As long as you do it before your paint has dried, it's pretty easy to clean up. And as I said before, the vines cover the majority of the surface area of this mini, so it is going to be quite a time-consuming step to pick out all of those little vine details. But in the end, I find it's really worth it. One of the techniques that I find helpful in painting these vines without painting the skeleton is when you're reloading the paint onto the brush, instead of doing that twisting pulling motion that I was doing with the fine detail brush, this time you want to drag it flat to create sort of a wedge shape with the end of your paintbrush with all of the paint on one side of it. That way the back half of the brush that doesn't have as much paint on it is less likely to touch something and transfer paint to an area that you don't want. Also, then the area that does have the paint on it is a slightly flatter, wider surface and you can paint a little bit faster. And while I'm picking out all of the details of these vines, now would be a great opportunity to hit that like button if you're enjoying the video and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Clicking that like button or leaving me a comment down below are two of the best ways to let YouTube know that you are enjoying this video and that tells them to recommend it to more people. You could also drop me a comment down below letting me know other things you'd like to see me make on this channel. Now from time to time as you're painting, you will start to notice the paint in your paintbrush starting to dry out. You may not quite realize what it is at first, but things just stop working quite as smoothly as they were before. At that point, it's a good idea to rinse out your brush, give it a couple rinses sometimes, really make sure that you work out any paint that's starting to dry, and then start fresh with a clean brush and it should be back to that nice smooth paint. Oh, and as you can see right there, I got some paint on what I thought was a vine, but as it turns out, that is just part of the bone. Not to worry, as long as the paint is still wet, this is pretty easy to fix. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give my brush a quick rinse, and then making sure that I have a little bit of water in that clean brush, I'm gonna come in and very gently sort of mop at that spilled bit, Oh, and it's flooding a bit with the amount of water that I've got, so I'm going to dry that off a little. Go back in, and in that same way that we used a gentle repetitive motion to scrape clean our connection points from the sprue, we're going to keep moving our brush in that gentle repetitive motion until we slowly wipe the paint away. And you might need to rinse your brush out a couple of times while you do this to keep moving that paint off. Then once it's pretty well cleaned up, you want to dry off your brush and mop up any water left over, and then we can get right back to painting. And you can really see how that painting handle is useful, letting me manipulate this mini in all different directions to really get into all the little nooks and crannies. And this is one of the places where you really start to see the benefit of that zenithal highlight that we did earlier. As you're painting the vine, the tops of the vines where it's white are going to be a much brighter, lighter green color, and the bottom where everything is black is going to stay much darker. It's a great example of how much your base coat can really affect the overall result of what you paint. Now, because I'm working with craft paints instead of artist acrylics or miniature paints, this really doesn't give very good coverage. So you'll notice as I'm painting up the skeleton, I'm frequently going back to areas as they start to dry and adding a little bit more coverage. I want to make sure that my first coat is as even as possible. And once again, making sure that we are getting all the way wrapped down to that hand and sword making sure all the vine bits are green, and really being careful down by that hand, making sure that I don't accidentally paint the thumb. Now I saved the missing limb for last because on this bit I don't have to be nearly as careful. As soon as I know I'm away from all of the bone, I can get a little bit fast and messy and just make sure that I'm getting paint into all of those nooks and crannies as quickly as I can. And now that that beginning bit has completely dried, I'm going to go back over and do a bit of a second coat here, just making sure that I don't have any spots where that bright white is still showing through. All right. 
right, and oh, it looks like I got a little bit of paint onto the leg here. So once again, we're just gonna do a rinse out of the brush and with a pretty damp brush, go in and clean that up, wipe away any excess and then go back into those final touch-ups. And I really wanna make sure that all of these vines up by the face are completely covered. The closer you are to the focal point on your mini, the more people are gonna be paying attention to that area. And now that first coat that we put onto the outstretched arm is finally dry, so I can go back and give that a second coating. Really making sure you get the brush into that center spiral there. Oh yeah, he's looking good. I really like the color of that sepia wash with this green. Then we'll just set that aside to dry. Clean up a bit here. Now that that craft paint has completely dried, as you can see, it doesn't quite have the coverage that I'm looking for. So I'm gonna go back and do what's basically at this point a third coat with that paint color. That's really one of the main differences I've found with paints when looking between craft paints, artist acrylics, and miniature paints. The main difference is the amount of pigment that you have in the paint. Craft paint doesn't have very much pigment in it, so you're gonna need a lot of coats to get full coverage. Artist acrylics have a decent amount of pigment in them, so depending on the shade, you can get full coverage with one coat, sometimes two or three, for those lighter colors like yellows and oranges. And then with the miniature paints, part of why they're so expensive is they're very pigment rich. So you often can get full coverage with just one coat. The long and the short of it is, if you can't afford those expensive mini paints, your craft paints will work just fine. You're just gonna have to paint each mini a couple of times. So just as before, I just wanna make sure that I'm being very thorough and covering absolutely everything in this nice, rich, vibrant green. And once again, I'm just making sure with that extra arm spiral that I'm getting my paintbrush down the center to make sure the inside is also painted. And then we'll give him a quick once over here. Uh, it looks like I do have a little bit of paint on the knee. So let's just rinse out the brush and get that cleaned up here. Dabbing gently with that brush tip to sort of wash and rinse that little bit off. Yeah, there we go. Dry that extra water out of the brush before I reload with paint. Don't want to be watering this down and just touch up a few areas where I can still see a little bit of that white poking through. Let's give him a slow spin, take a look. Oh yeah, I'm very happy with how he's looking. So I'm gonna set him aside to dry. Our final step on the mini itself is going to be a black wash. And here's a look at a before and after that black wash, so you can really get a good idea of what the result is gonna be. I personally really like having that darker, grittier, slightly dirty look to all of my dungeon minis. But if you prefer to have a cleaner look, that might not be the way you wanna go. But since I really like that dark aesthetic that the wash gives me, we're gonna move forward. So I'm gonna stick him back to my painting handle and grab my jar of black wash. And I'm using that same slightly larger brush so that it has a good chance to soak up the wash. Once again, I'm gonna start with the head, really making sure to fill all those crevices on the face. I want those recesses to be dark with shadow. And then from there, I'm gonna move down and just cover the rest of the mini in a nice all over coverage. Now, when you're refilling that wash brush, you'll notice that I'm tapping it off on the lid each time. You don't wanna have too much wash in the brush, otherwise you start to lose control. And definitely make sure you're getting the underside of arms and poking into all of those crevices. Then once I'm sure I have an all-over coverage of the mini, I go back in with my brush and start to pick up the wash in any places where it looks like I have too much. You don't want to have it pooling everywhere, you just want to have a good coating. Alright, then we'll give him the quick once over, make sure we are happy with how everything looks. Oh, and in looking at it, I really feel like the top of his head has gotten a little bit dark. So I'm gonna wring all of the wash out of my brush here and see if I can't just lighten that up a little bit go back and soak up these little puddles that have run to the low points. Give him one more quick check, and he is good to go. I'm gonna set him aside to dry, give a firm click shut to my wash, and once he's dry, we can move on to painting up that base. So we're gonna grab that fancy palette, and I'm gonna start my base with this gray craft paint. Now, just as I did with the vines matching the color of paint to my existing vines, I'm doing the same thing with my bases. All of my minis are standing on a gravel patch that matches the stone of my dungeon tiles. I know that a lot of people really enjoy decorating their bases up to be snazzy and fancy, but for me, I like the bases of my pieces to sort of blend into the game board as much as possible so that the mini is the important part and the base sort of just isn't something that stands out. There are so many different ways that you can base your minis and none of them are wrong. Just go with whatever works best for you. 
Now I do find when I'm painting these high textured areas like the train ballast, sometimes the paint is a little bit too thick. If you're finding that the paint doesn't go as far on the base as you feel like it should go, that's when you just want to add a little bit of water to help it flow a little bit more smoothly over the area. It is going to mean that all of the high points are going to have a very thin coat, but the amount of overbrushing and dry brushing that we're going to be doing on this will cover that up, so I'm not worried about it. Now once I've finished going around the feet of the skeleton and any places where the vines touch the base, I'm going to move up to a much wider brush to finish off the main surface area of the base and fill in that bigger space as quickly as possible. You always want to start by getting that brush damp so that the paint goes into the bristles easily. And I'm going to make sure that the paint is thin enough to spread and just knock out the rest of that base. And when I get to the edge, I make sure to overlap down onto the rim just a little bit, just to make sure that my base coverage isn't going to have a little rim of white around the edge. Oh, and it looks like there's a little spot in there next to the back foot that I did miss, so I'm going to rinse out this big brush and go back to my slightly smaller brush, because that's going to make it much easier to get into those tighter spaces without accidentally painting my skeleton. Alright, and do a quick check, make sure nothing else is missing. Yeah, that looks good. So I'm going to set him aside to dry and clean up my painting stuff here. Then once that coat is dry to the touch, we're going to do an overbrushing with a slightly lighter shade of gray. So we're going to put a little bit of that onto our palette. And I'm going to use a slightly more beat up brush that I use for dry brushing for this. You're not going to use any water in your brush this time. You want those bristles to be dry. And you're going to work a decent amount of paint into your bristles and then rub a good amount of it out into your paper towel. You don't want to get rid of all of the paint, but you want to get rid of most of it. Then using a very light pulling motion, I'm going to drag that brush all over the surface of my base so that the paint transfers just to the highest points of that texture. This really helps to define some of those deeper shadow areas versus the high points where the light's touching, and it helps keep the base from looking flat. And any time that you feel you're starting to press harder to get the paint to transfer, just load up a little bit more into the brush and keep going. And this is one of the few times where you don't want to have even coverage. If you have a couple places where there's a hot spot or a little bit more, that's actually beneficial because it's going to help give a more natural texture. All right, and that is looking good, so I'm going to set him aside to dry again. Once that's dry, our next step is going back to the black wash and giving it a once over across the base. Now you can paint the base to this point and do all of your black washing at once, but I find that a certain amount of the wash pools off the base around the feet of the skeleton, and I don't want to have it puddle on the base. I want to have some control over how much shade I get. So that's why I do this in two stages. I also tend to paint up a bunch of minis at once and then do all of the bases together as a sort of production line. That way I'm not pulling out all of these supplies to just do one base at a time. And so we're going to use that wash brush and just give a good thorough coating. And any time that you're washing, you want to make sure to let your paint cure before you start washing. If you start washing over a paint that's dry to the touch but hasn't cured yet, you can accidentally wash it away. And you don't want to have that happen. And when you're happy with your amount of wash, we're going to set him aside to dry again before doing our final two painting steps. The first is going to be our final dry brushing. We're going back to that same light gray color, but this time when we're working that paint out into the paper towel, we want to work almost as much as we can. You want barely any paint on this. This is a true dry brush as opposed to an overbrush. So we don't want it to completely cover that last coating. We want what's been washed over and made darker to still show through a bit under this final coating. And I like to test this stage in the palm of my hand to make sure I know exactly how much paint transfer I'm getting. You don't want to put this on your mini with more than you think you have because it's hard to fix it at this point. And then this is that same motion as before, but even lighter. You just want to touch the very tops of those stones. And this is a very quick step. You just want to give a good once over all the way around. And then I'm going to make sure to work out any paint that I've got left into that paper towel. Get my brush as clean as I can for this final painting step, which is going to be to paint the rim around our mini black. For this, I'm going to use my Vallejo Black Surface Primer. This is the deepest, richest black paint that I've got. So we're going to put a bit onto our palette here, and then I'm going to use that same nice wide brush that I was using before, and then I'm going to rest my painting handle in the palm of my hand so that I get a nice set distance, rest the brush against the rim of the miniature, and then all I have to do is spin that painting handle in my other hand, and it gives me a nice clean coating all the way around that base rim. 
and any time that I start a new spot with paint it's going to create a little bit of a thickness so I like to go a little ways ahead of where I am to start the stroke and then back up to where I was and get a nice smooth coating over it that way you don't have any spots where you get obvious brush strokes or lumps of paint all right do a quick check make sure I've got a good solid coating and then we're gonna set him aside to dry one final time the idea for these vine skeletons came to me from a Reddit post many years ago. Someone put forward the question, what if we mixed necromancy and animated vines? And it was something that just clicked for me. I loved the idea, and so I started playing with it. I created Vanya, the druid, along with her partner, the wizard Ambrose. And with the two of them working in concert, they're able to take the bones and infuse it with an additional plant life before breathing into it the unlife of necromancy. This results in skeletons that are stronger, faster, and more resilient. If you're interested in learning more, I've got stat blocks and character sheets for these guys available to all of my patrons. There's a link to my Patreon in the description below. Now, it's on to the glamour shots. Depending on the skeletons that are available to you, there are a lot of different ways that you can go with this. You can have a completely intact skeleton just wrapped with vines. He can be missing one, two, three, or even four limbs, as they may have found a skeleton in any sort of condition and made use of it. There's really no limit to the ways that this can be used, so just let your imagination run wild and have fun with it. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to give a huge thank you to my patrons. The support that you guys give me really helps me stay motivated. Now that I've shown you several of the ways that I've put together my vine skeletons, let's go see how they're gonna look on the table. As you cut across the fields towards what you're fairly certain is the main road, the smell of sun-warmed strawberries fills the air. All at once, from the hedgerows surrounding the field, crawl creatures of vine and bone. As the rustling subsides, a familiar voice calls out to you. You thought you could escape me that easily? How sweet. Looks like you're in quite the jam now. Roll for initiative. And so there you have it. That is how I make my vine skeletons for my necrobotanists. Tune into the next episode. I'm going to be showing you how I make my animated vines. Stick around. Thanks for spending some of your time here with me at Scattered Terrain. If you liked that video, hit the like button. If you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. And I'll see you next time.